For your entertainment and pleasure, here is Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden. It's time once again for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks, under the direction of Al Lewis. But first... A recent news announcement gave added proof to the old saying, it's a small world. In fact, it's even smaller than we thought. The Army Map Service, using an improved way of measuring the equatorial radius of the Earth, found that it's exactly 420 feet shorter than previously figured. But the Earth is shrinking in another sense, too. The telegraph, radio, telephone, all the improved methods of communication have made it pretty small. We get all the news from around the world almost as it happens. And there's more understanding in a world where nations and people can compare notes, ask questions, exchange information. Our servicemen are an important part of this international gab fest. They're right on the spot in a lot of different countries where they have a chance to talk to the people get their viewpoints, and give them ours. One of the most effective weapons they carry is truth. Before we can have agreement between nations, we have to have understanding between people. That's part of the assignment we give to our ambassadors in uniform. Remember, a country is known by its people. What people think of your country depends on you. Well, for many of us, the early morning hours aren't the most cheerful time of the day. So it is with our Miss Brooks, who teaches English at Madison High School. Fortunately, however, by the time we've had our second cup of coffee, most of us feel a good deal better. How true that is. I always feel quite a bit better after my second cup of coffee, which I have at 7.30 in the evening. <laughs> But when some extremely fortunate occurrence is impending, I can even be cheerful at breakfast. That was the case last Friday when I joined my landlady in the dinette. Oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. My, you're in a good humor this morning, Polly. It is <laughs> grand to hear you singing like this. Thanks, Mrs. Davis. I've got a wonderful feeling. Everything's going my way. <laughs> and it's such a nice song, too. The beautiful Blue Danube. <laughs> the Strausses have always been my favorite. The Strausses, mine too. I wouldn't get my meat anyplace else. <laughs> This reminds me of the last time you were in such high spirits. I'll never forget that morning. You flitted around like a gay little bird. When was that, Mrs. Davis? The day you found out that Mr. Conklin had to stay in bed with the flu. <laughs> so I've got even better news than that today. You mean Mr. Conklin's resigned? Please, Mrs. Davis. <laughs> Let's not wish for the moon. <laughs> But I did hear that Miss Enright is leaving school for the rest of the semester. She is? Yes. It seems her spinster sister is ill upstate. So Miss Enright's gotten a leave of absence and she's going up to nurse her. You mean Miss Enright's going to nurse her spinster sister for the rest of the semester? Yes. Oh, she'll nurse the spinster sister for the rest of the <laughs> semester and the way we'll go. Ooh. Oh, forgive me, Mrs. Davis. <laughs> I can't get that blue Danube out of my head. <laughs> well, I know Daisy Enright's always been a rival of yours, Connie, so I can't blame you for being happy about her going. This leaves you a clear field with Mr. Boynton, doesn't it? Exactly. Now there's nothing between Mr. Boynton and me except Mr. Boynton. <laughs> but, Mr. Davis, you don't seem so enthusiastic about the news. Frankly, I'm not. Miss Enright's been conducting the course in Red Cross First Aid I've been taking three nights a week. Well, cheer up, Mrs. Davis. Even if the course is discontinued, you can take it again next season. But I was hoping to get some practical experience, Connie. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's Walter Denton to drive me to school. Be right with you, Walter. Mm -hmm. If you want first aid experience, Mrs. Davis, why don't you come out to the car and watch us take off? <laughs> 
take off. Yes, the way Walter starts that jalopy, it's ten to one I'll bang my head on the windshield. <laughs> that we're on our way. Let's have a nice, smooth ride to school, Walter. Okay, Miss Brooks. <laughs> Say, I'm sorry you banged your head on the windshield when we started. Oh, forget it. It's only a flesh wound. <laughs> Just try to control your tendency to speed, won't you? Yeah, I'll try. But it's awfully difficult on a beautiful day like today. I think I know how you feel, Walter. I'm rather related, too. And I'll bet our joy stems from the same source, the imminent departure of one Daisy Enright. I couldn't be any happier if two Daisy Enrights were leaving. <laughs> I mean, Miss Enright's a very good teacher, Walter. Why should you be happy to see her go? Well, because my mother's been taking her first aid course, and everything she studies, she tries out on my father and me. Well, you shouldn't complain about that, Walter. Your mother's just trying to learn how to take better care of her family. Yeah, she sure took care of me last Monday. Seems she had to do some splint practice, so naturally she used me. You seem a little flexible for a splint, Walter. <laughs> no, she put the splint on my leg, Miss Brooks. And then, then she told me to walk across the room. And did you? I took one step and fell on my face. <laughs> what did your mother do then? She bandaged my face. <laughs> but with six yards of sterile gauze. <laughs> Could have used more, but my dad had nine yards wrapped around him. Your house must have looked like an Arab settlement. <laughs> well, with Miss Enright leaving, they'll probably discontinue the class until next year anyhow. Uh, but surely you've had similar experiences to mine. Mrs. Davis takes the same course. Doesn't she practice on you? No, Walter. Luckily, I've been out a good deal of the time. Mrs. Davis does all her first aid practicing on our next-door neighbor. Oh, Mrs. Landfield? That's right. Limpy Landfield, we call her. <laughs> Hi, Miss Brooks. Didn't Walter drive you to school today? Yes, Harriet. He'll be along in a minute. Oh, you certainly look radiant this morning, Miss Brooks. What's the reason for the big smile? I just told you Walter drove me to school, Harriet. I always smile when I get out of his car alive. <laughs> Whatever the reason, I'm glad you're so cheerful, Miss Brooks. Thank you, Harriet. Oh, before I forget, Daddy wants to see you in his office immediately. Have you any idea what he wants to see me about? No, but he sounded even more urgent than usual. You better get right on in, Miss Brooks. Very well, Harriet. I'll see you in class. Good luck, Miss Brooks. Enter. <laughs> uh, you wanted to see me, Mr. Conklin? I could answer more truthfully if you rephrased the question. <laughs> There's something about which you must see me? Uh, that's better. Yes. <laughs> Sit down, please. Now, I don't know whether or not you're aware of it, but our school is about to suffer a grievous loss. Miss Enright is leaving. I know. It's, it's terrible. <laughs> Please try to control your sobs. Since her sister is ailing, I've granted Miss Enright a leave of absence effective at once. You see, there's no one else to take care of the poor creature. And so Miss Enright that... will have to nurse her spinster sister for the rest of the semester. Exactly, Miss Brooks. <laughs> Believe me, it is with deep regret that I'll bid farewell to Miss Enright. She embodies all those qualities I most esteem in a teacher. She's very capable, Mr. Conklin, and I'm sure that uh, she's you... She's more than capable, Miss Brooks. When Miss Enright goes, I can't help feeling that some part of our school is going with her. Well, we shouldn't begrudge her a few pencils and erasers. <laughs> I mean, she'll be back in the fall, Mr. Conklin. I sincerely hope so. Now then, since it is too late in the season to hire outside help, this vacancy must be filled by other members of our faculty assuming additional duties. I think I just heard the school bell, Mr. Conklin, so if you'll excuse me, but There I'll... was no bell, Miss Brooks. <laughs> Sit down. 
Although her classes will be taken over by Mr. Chalmers, Miss Enright leaves another most important post to be filled, namely the Red Cross first aid course she conducted three nights a week. There goes that bell again. <laughs> be seated, Miss Brooks. <laughs> In mentioning this post to you, I must remind you that in spite of the high honor that goes with the office, there is absolutely no financial recompense whatsoever. That bell is getting louder every minute. <laughs> Look, Mr. Conklin, it's been years since I got my certificate in first aid. Since and... the Red Cross, like Madison High itself, is run on a purely democratic basis, one may only serve it by exercising one's own free choice to serve. It's purely voluntary. But how do you know I'll volunteer, Mr. Conklin? Miss Brooks, <laughs> do you have a large bank account? Why, no, sir. And is teaching the only profession with which you are familiar? That's right, sir. And would you like to continue to make a living in this profession, Miss Brooks? <laughs> Certainly, sir. Well, <laughs> well, then. I hereby exercise my own free, democratic, voluntary choice of saying yes. Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, will continue in just a moment. But first, if you were a millionaire and changed all the money you owned into single dollar bills and pressed those bills together as tightly as you could, you couldn't compress them into a single solitary tree. A tree takes years to grow and mature, and no amount of money can buy that. That's why, even if you're a millionaire, you can't afford a forest fire. On the other hand, even if you don't have a million in the bank, you can still afford the moment or two it takes to make sure a cigarette or matchstick is fully extinguished before you toss it away. And no one is so poor he can't afford that little bit of effort that dousing a campfire requires. Be careful whenever you're in or around a forest area. Help prevent forest fires. Well, learning that I had to take over Daisy Enright's first aid course didn't help my appetite any. Nevertheless, when lunchtime came, I went to the school cafeteria, baited a table with meatloaf, and sat down to wait for Mr. Boynton. But as I toyed with my salad, it was Miss Enright's voice that broke in on my reverie. Well, Miss Brooks, as I live and breathe. Two faults that are easily remedied. <laughs> well, what are you doing, darling? Feeding your full little face again? What do you mean, again? I haven't had anything to eat since... What do you mean, full little face? <laughs> Just take it easy, darling. We've all got our troubles. Look. Look at what's happening with my poor sister, for instance. It's such a pathetic case. Picture, if you can, a poor, lonely spinster with hardly a friend in the world, practically no one to turn to. I sympathize with you, Miss Enright. Now tell me about your sister. <laughs> what a quaint sense of humor. Now, but there's something I want to discuss with you. Do you mind if I sit down here for a moment? Not at all. I can't digest this food anyway. <laughs> Miss Brooks, I understand that you've been requested to complete my first aid course. Or is the word volunteered? The word is railroaded. <laughs> What I can't figure out is why Mr. Conklin picked on me. Oh, you were a natural for the job, my dear. Otherwise, I would never have recommended you. You recommended me? Oh, dear. Now the cat is out of the bag, isn't it? I don't blame you for being self-conscious. <laughs> Are you inferring? If the bag fits, get back in it. <laughs> really going out in a blaze of infamy, aren't you? Going out? Oh, oh, but that's what I sat down to tell you, darling. I'm not going anyplace. My sister has decided to come down here and live with me. Isn't that a relief? It's such a relief, I may kill myself. <laughs> well, 
Well, at least I won't have to conduct those classes of yours. Oh, but you will, darling. That's one of the provisions I made when I agreed to stay. I told Mr. Conklin that I'd have to spend all my free time with my sister, and he said that he didn't mind a bit, as long as you took over for me. As one English teacher to another, Miss Enright, I'd just like to say that I am the one who has been took over. <laughs> I just don't think it's fair for you Good to Good afternoon, step... ladies. I hope I'm not interrupting anything. Oh, no, not a thing, Mr. Boynton. Miss Brooks was speaking. <laughs> Sit down. Well, thanks, Miss Enright. Oh, that food you've got looks very appetizing, Mr. Boynton. Oh, yes, I, I thought I'd take a whirl at the pot roast today. But I kept this plate of meatloaf covered for you, Mr. Boynton. Oh, I can probably handle them both. I'm starved. <laughs> oh, my, that roast looks yummy. <laughs> and so does the meatloaf. Would you care to try one or the other, Miss Enright? Why don't you try both, Miss Enright? You can feed one of your faces, and I'll feed the other. <laughs> Uh, I think Miss Brooks is a trifle miffed because she's going to have to take over some of my duties. Well, yes, I, I heard you were leaving, Miss Enright. When are you going? Surprise, surprise. I'm not going at all, Mr. Boynton. You're not? No. Well, well, that is a pleasant bit of news. Did you hear that, Miss Brooks? Miss Enright's staying on. She's not leaving at all. Isn't that just splendid? <laughs> Oh, eat your pot roast. <laughs> My dear sister is coming to live with me, Mr. Boynton. I'm going to take care of her. Oh, I see. Well, well that'll keep you pretty close to home most evenings, won't it? Oh, oh, I don't know. One can't look after one's sister every night. Now can one? If one doesn't go out until one's asked, one can. <laughs> Excuse me, I've got several things to do. Oh, do you have to go so soon, Miss Brooks? I'm afraid I do, Mr. Boynton. Here's your check for the meatloaf. Oh, uh, thank you, Miss Brooks. But uh, where, uh, well, where is, is your... Uh, I uh, paid my check, Mr. Boynton. Oh, well, uh, so long. <laughs> Darling, I'd like to remind you that I'm coming over to your house tonight to brush you up on the first aid course. It was Mr. Conklin's idea. What? As a matter of fact, he's coming along with me. But I didn't plan he on... He said we'd be there at 8 sharp, Miss Brooks, so you'd better be ready at that time. You know, this first aid course is Mr. Conklin's pet project. Uh, sort of like Mr. Boynton is to certain other members of the faculty. <laughs> if you know what I mean, dear Mr. Boynton. <laughs> huh? <laughs> I guess it's safe to leave him here for a few minutes. <laughs> well, if the Emperor has spoken, I guess I'll see you tonight, Miss Enright. Goodbye, Mr. Boynton. Uh, goodbye, Miss Brooks. Oh, uh, don't stop at the dessert counter, dear. From the back, those calories show like mad. <laughs> if I could plead manslaughter, I'd kill her. <laughs> and all the unjust, tyrannical... I'll take it easy, Miss Brooks. You know what talking to yourself is the first sign of, don't you? Yes, Walter, but I don't care. Oh, things can't be that terrible. Tell Uncle Walt what's the matter. <laughs> it's pretty bad, Unc. <laughs> Miss Enright just told me that she and Mr. Conklin are coming over to my place tonight to brush me up on her first aid course. What's so bad about that? This is a chance to kill two of your favorite birds with one stone. If you're going to show them what you remember from your first date experience, you get a chance to not only clobber Miss Enright, but to show Mr. Conklin that you're totally unfit to take over the job. Well, Miss Brooks, what do you think of the scheme? Walter, if we were in France, I'd kiss you on both cheeks and give you the Legion of Honor. <laughs> Good evening, Miss Brooks. Hello, Mr. Conklin, Miss Enright. Come in, won't you? Thank you. Just leave your coats and heads out here. A hat <laughs> out here. <laughs> Thank you, darling. Well, are you all prepared for your refresher course? 
I really don't think it'll be necessary, Miss Enright. You see, I've been rereading my manual, and you'd be surprised how quickly the things I'd learned came back to me. Well, I'm delighted to hear that, Miss Brooks. But if you're going to instruct others, I'd like to see some practical demonstration of this knowledge. Of course, sir. Just follow me into the living room, please. As you can see, I've moved most of the furniture into one corner of the room, and I've got the splints, bandages, and adhesive all ready. Excellent. Now then, let's get right to business. We will suppose that our subject has sustained a fractured elbow and a broken ankle. Let's make it two broken ankles. <laughs> Very well, two broken ankles. And now then, lie down, Miss Brooke. Yes, sir, then we can... Wait a minute, why should I lie down? If someone had sustained two broken ankles and a fractured elbow, is it too unreasonable to assume she'd be lying down? <laughs> no, sir, but the wrong bones are being broken. That is, I want to show you what I know about first aid. Miss Enright's the one who must lie down. Oh, you want me to pretend I've been through an accident? Believe me, it's typecasting. <laughs> Just crumple, dear. The rug is spotless so far. <laughs> well, now, uh, let, let's get on with it. Do as she says, Miss Enright. Oh, very well. Now, we'll assume that Miss Enright has been in an automobile accident, and besides having both arms broken, she's in an acute state of shock. Shock? Well, how do I react? As if Mr. Boynton finally asked you for a date. <laughs> now, my first job is to kneel by her side and take care of the arm. This silk sleeve seems to be covering up the injury. This is a brand new dress. Please. What do you want to be, neat or cured? <laughs> now, it's, it's obvious from the looks of this arm that it's badly injured. Where my fingers touch, it's all black and blue. See, Mr. Conklin? Where? Where is it black and blue? Ouch! Right there. <laughs> now, hand me that catsup bottle, please, Mr. Conklin. Well, here you are, but what's it for? Realism. This was a pretty bad accident, remember? Oh, Brooks, you're ruining my dress. Quiet, you're in a state of shock. <laughs> now we'll start bandaging the arm. First, I put the splint gently against the skin. Oh! <laughs> then I start the roller bandage here. <clears throat> now I wrap the gauze with one arm this way. Yes, go on. Then I put the other arm through and tie the bandage this way. Now I reverse the process, again bringing the other arm through the bandage and wrapping it securely. Uh, now what? Now if someone will untie my arms, I'll continue. <laughs> uh, Miss Brooks, can you or can you not tie a firm bandage? This splint was a bit too rough, Mr. Conklin, but if Miss Enright will let me use one of her legs... Now, see here, Miss Brooks. Now, please, please cooperate, Miss Enright. Stand up and let's see if Miss Brooks can tie a firm bandage on your leg. Well, if you insist, Mr. Conklin, there. Now then, Mr. Conklin, if you'll just stand nearby and hand me a few things... Very well, very well. Please. Uh, first, please pass me the adhesive. Uh, here you are. Now, we'll take down your stocking, Miss Enright. There. And wrap this adhesive nice and tight. There. Well, Miss Brooks, but you don't put adhesive next to the skin. First, the bandage must come. You're so right, darling. Off you come, adhesive. <laughs> now, now we take this bandage and... Oh, uh, hand me a splint, please, Mr. Conklin. Uh, here, here. The idea is to get a good, steady support for the leg. Around we go with the bandage, all around the splint. Another bandage, please, Mr. Conklin. Uh, here's one. Now we wrap this around the other one. Now the adhesive, round and round and round. There. How does that feel? Solid? Very, Very solid. Very solid. <laughs> good grief, you've tied Miss Enright's leg to mine. <laughs> one of those legs had more wool on it than the other. <laughs> Will you please get this bandage untied? I'll have to tear this splint out first. <laughs> Ouch! There's a big splinter right in my thumb. Good. Now, for your next test, let's suppose that somebody's got a big splinter right in his thumb. Oh, I'll get it. 
Mr. Boynton, come on in. Well, I just dropped by to return a book I borrowed from Mrs. Davis, but... I... Oh, you've got company. Please join us, Mr. Boynton. All right. Oh, good evening, Mr. Conklin, Miss Enright. Say, what are you doing, having a three-legged race? <laughs> Don't be funny, Boynton. <laughs> there has been an accident. <laughs> What's that on Miss Enright's dress? Oh, no. A biology teacher who faints at the sight of catsup. I didn't faint, Miss Brooks. I, I just slipped on this scatter rug. Well, stop jabbering, everyone. I've got to get this splinter removed. Would you like me to probe, Mr. Conklin? Keep away from me, you angel of destruction. Let us see it, Mr. Conklin. Daisy Enright's on the job. I'll get it out for you in just a jiffy. Now, here's a nice clean pin. Now, give Daisy your thumb. Come on, come to Daisy. Down, Daisy, down, girl. <laughs> Here. Here, Miss Enright. Now, please be careful. Oh, there's nothing to it, Mr. Conklin. There, it's out. Say, that didn't hurt a bit. It's remarkable, Miss Enright. You know, everyone should master first aid. I've been thinking of taking that course myself. You have? Yes. I'd like to sign up right now for the balance of the semester. It's a deal. Monday night at 8, I throw out the first bandage. Over my limp carcass, you do. <laughs> Miss Enright? I'll move heaven and earth if you take over your old course. Oh, well, that won't be necessary, Mr. Conklin. Now, she's halfway to heaven already. <laughs> oh, well, Miss Enright, there's just one question I'd like to ask you. Yes, Miss Brooke? What sort of splint does one use after one cuts one's throat? <laughs> Miss Brooks returns in just a moment. They say that Michelangelo, the artist, was able to draw a perfect circle freehand. If you think that's easy, just try it sometime. Anyhow, whenever he made a call on a friend and the friend was out, he used to leave a card with a perfect circle on it, and everyone knew that Michelangelo had been there. It's rather odd how friendship and circles seem to go together. We talk about the family circle and the circle of friends. That's probably why we think of the whole world as just an overgrown neighborhood. In a neighborhood, we sometimes have misunderstandings and disagreements, but we work things out, visiting over the back fence, exchanging recipes and ideas, helping someone with his garden. Those all have their counterparts on the international scene. Right now, the biggest visitors in the world are the American servicemen, they're exchanging ideas with our neighbors in other countries, and they're helping a lot of them to improve their own ways of life. If our men in uniform can help promote better understanding between ourselves and other people, they can bring us closer to the time when there won't be any disagreements or unneighborly attitudes. Do your part in enlarging the circle of friendship. Remember, a country is known by its people. What people think of your country depends on you. And now, once again, here is our Miss Brooks. Well, Mr. Conklin was so delighted at Miss Enright's decision to resume her first aid class that he insisted on treating her to an ice cream soda before taking her home. So they were out of the house before I could reach her jugular vein. <laughs> That's when I got out my Red Cross manual. If, uh, if you're so interested in first aid, Mr. Boynton, maybe we could practice a bit before your first lesson. Oh, I'd love to, Miss Brooks. Uh, here's an interesting problem. Huh? It deals with a back injury. For want of a better subject, let's just say I'm the injured party. 
Now, you place your left arm around my shoulders. Like this? <sighs> yes. <laughs> then your right arm goes around my waist. Like this? What does the book say we should do next? Never mind the book. Ad lib a little. <laughs> Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, is produced by Larry Byrne, written by Al Lewis and Arthur Alsberg, with the music of Wilbur Hatch. Mr. Conklin was played by Gail Gordon. Others in tonight's cast were Jane Morgan, Dick Crenna, Gloria McMillan, and Mary Jane Croft. Be with us again next week at this same time. This.